This is the story of the enormous and unpredictable Icelandic volcano Askja that has been getting ready for an eruption since 2012 and will the giant wake up gently or are we about to witness a major explosive event like in 1875? My name is Gilvi and welcome to the Just Icelandic channel that covers numerous topics about Iceland and of course the hottest volcano news. This video is a bit long and it's going to make it easier for me to do more short updates so new subscribers and new viewers can catch up fast with the full story. I am however starting this with the most recent news since my last update about Askja was a bit shocking and obviously hard to believe for some or this story of the research professor that recently stated that we could be looking at uh, 10 cubic kilometers magma intrusion under the volcano. So uh, I did some more browsing and found a radio interview where the state broadcasting service was uh, questioning uh, this uh, very same professor. And he stated there that it was this group of experts from Cambridge University that uh, came to the conclusion that the magma intrusion could be uh, 10 to 100 cubic kilometers. And this is actually quite hard to believe, I must say. And to put this in some context, the largest basaltic eruption in the vicinity of Askja is uh, the Kotlota Dinja lava shield, which is uh, 17 cubic kilometers, making it a bit easier to see this uh, enormous amount of magma they are suggesting under there. And the lake Askja is uh, 1.2 cubic kilometers of water. So those numbers that our experts got are not leaving us with a story of accuracy. So uh, it might just as well be that uh, our own experts are simply not uh, buying this or they prefer to slide this under the door like they've done so far. However, I'm not going to let this interrupt the rest of the video. I have uh, plenty to cover or uh, the history of Aska the last eruptions, especially the explosive eruption in 1875, the aftermath and uh, use that information that we come up with on this way to uh, look into the future. And as always, I'm here to simplify things. I'm not a scientist, so I won't be decorating my text with technicalities that uh, I might even not understand fully myself. And the first question is, what is Aska? And uh, it is a volcano situated a uh, little over 50 kilometers away from Iceland's uh, hot spot. And uh, what we notice first is uh, how high Askja is rising up above the surrounding plateau. And up there we find uh, three interlocking calderas and uh, a lake that came into being after this uh, highly explosive eruption in 1875. And the bottom of the lake is more or less just the upper part of the caldera roof that sank down after the eruption in 1875. So Iceland's second deepest lake is not so old and it might even be gone soon. When we look at this caldera complex from the north, we see how enormous amount of volcanic material has surged up there, telling us a bit about the powerful systems. And the story of Aska is not the only story about the giants in the neighborhood. Nearby, we have Trölladinga, or Trolls Shield, and it is Iceland's biggest shield volcano, reaching a height of uh, almost 1500 meters above sea level, and uh, 600 meters above the surrounding plateau. And uh, that is where we find uh, Ótáðarhraun lava field, the largest continuous lava field in Iceland, 4400 square kilometers, and it's believed that it originated from uh, numerous sources up on the highlands. So we are truly in the presence of some of the mightiest magma machines on Mother Earth. And not only is the central volcano Askja impressive, its uh, fissure swarm is almost 200 kilometers long and uh, stretches to the north for the most part, making this one of the largest volcanic systems in Iceland. So let's look at the 1875 episode that uh, represents maybe just uh, a part of uh, Askja's capabilities. And uh, as for the history, I will be using interviews with the people who lived close by 
and uh, fortunately no one died back then and uh, we can thank that to this uh, remote location on the highlands and the story starts here where we cross the mountains between the north and east Iceland or uh, on the junction where we find a farm that is still there and called the Grimsstaðir and the first news came in 1874 when the local people noticed uh, steam or uh, behind Mount Herðubreið the queen of Icelandic mountains and then it was uh, shortly before Christmas that the earthquake started and it was a magma intrusion widening some of the nearby fractures on the Askja Fisher Swarm or around 50 to 70 kilometers to the north from the volcano and uh, the earthquakes got worse every day until the earthquake swarm seemed to reach the peak January 2nd, 1875 and there were so many of them that day that the farmer described this as uh, one continuous earthquake throughout the day and the next day the first fires could be seen from the highlands but uh, it wasn't until February 15th that uh, an expedition was sent out to examine the conditions up there and uh, they described the land as already very fractured from the first chapter and it struck them as uh, very odd to see all the jets of uh, water coming up from the ground and uh, starting to form a pond and it is then uh, February 18th when the next uh, chapter starts and that is when the eruption came up on the Askia Fisher Swarm far away from the volcano and uh, according to the local people, the fires would come and go, and up to 20 lava fountains were spewing up lava at once. And that chapter would peak uh, March 18th and 23rd, with as many as 40 lava fountains stretching even further north, covering the old highway, or around 70 kilometers away from the central volcano. So it was around 20 kilometer long part of the fissure swarm that was erupting, but the eruptive fissures were not continuous, but very impressive though, as the old tales describe this, or brightest daylight inside houses during night, despite the little windows that Icelandic houses had back then. And at the same time, Askja was also erupting, and gradually its plume moved higher into the atmosphere, indicating increased activity, and it was then almost four months after this started, or March 29th, that uh, all hell breaks loose. Large number of explosions were heard throughout the north and the east, and even as far as to South Iceland, over 200 kilometers away, a huge cloud of steam could be seen for an hour, and the tephra began to fall as far as uh, 50 kilometers away, but the worst was yet to come, or the Big Bang, and the ash column rose up to 30 kilometers height, and it could be seen uh, throughout Iceland, and this uh, explosive chapter lasted for 17 hours. But this wasn't over. Farmers describe uh, yet another fissure eruption, starting in late April, and it was highly explosive, sending lava bombs all around, and then we had uh, yet another fissure eruption in August, and I'm leaving a link to uh, one of the best sources we have since back then, or a travel book that uh, William Lord Watts wrote. And uh, he managed to see some of the last chapters of this uh, highly unusual eruption. And uh, mentions uh, especially the groundwater coming up that uh, later would become subject of uh, modern science reports that cover the groundwater flow dynamics around there or the reason why this was so highly explosive chapter. So check the reports for technical details and I will be going after the plume of ash and tephra that was windblown to the west all the way to Norway, Sweden, Germany and Poland. But uh, as for inhabited areas in Iceland, the fallout would hit a valley called Jökuldalur or 60-70 kilometers away and left them with uh, 40 cm thick coat of volcanic material, even uh, glowing lava bombs. Or as the local people described this, when an ash plume came, it was as close to hell as possible. Not only was it pitch black, they couldn't see a thing, there was this uh, enormous electricity in the air, people didn't even dare to stick their hand out the window, and uh, then it was a thunders and lightnings. And uh, 150 kilometers downwind, the tephra was uh, 2 centimeters deep, and the old landscape by Askja had uh, ceased to be. 
And the reading between the lines in all the news articles, this uh, could have been worse, especially when we look at the many other problems that we had in Iceland back then, the overall uh, poor living quality, even starvation. So the migration to the West had already started, but the Ashke eruption was of course uh, fueling the largest waves to come, mainly from East Iceland, and the many of them moved to Manitoba, where a town was established in 1875 as a reserve for Icelanders. And that story is of uh, such size that I'm linking to a documentary that I have on my channel, and I highly recommend it. But I did a whole lot of browsing for information about uh, agriculture especially, and it came as a surprise how fast uh, most of the land recovered. The grass harvest was uh, above average in the whole country in 1876, but the Jökuldalur Valley, that got the thickest deposits, it took the land there years to recover, although it did not recover fully in a way, since most of the people there, they moved west. But uh, elsewhere, the farmers soon discovered that there was something in the ass that worked as a fertilizer, and uh, it must have helped us that the fallout took only a few hours for the most part, so it wasn't a long time until people could just start uh, cleaning. But uh, the wind blew the ash back and forth, so when the wind turned, they had to start all over again. So this wasn't easy. And Askia would not wake up again until 1921, and uh, sent us uh, seven eruptions near the caldera. And the last eruption was in 1961, or what we call a tourist fissure eruption. And since then, the land subsided until August 2021, or when land uplift was first detected, or over 50 centimeters now, in less than two years, and still rising steadily, about one millimeter a day. Or to make this simple, there is something big going on under there. Despite this uh, land uplift, there have been relatively low number of earthquakes detected there, indicating that it's plenty of room for more in the storage down there, but uh, the magma is at very little depth, perhaps as little as 2-3 kilometers, and uh, there has been a lot of seismic activity by the Askia fissure swarm to the north, but that's been going on for like 20-30 years, so I've been told that uh, those earthquakes are a part of a separate event that is taking place around here by those mountains called Uptippingar. So when the seismic activity around Mount Herdebre started just a few months ago, it was not making things easier. Or are those earthquakes a part of this persistent unrest by Uptippingar? Is that swarm just moving around? Or might we be looking at a magma intrusion from the central volcano, Askia, shooting to the north? just like before the 1875 eruption. The news that turned everything around here in Iceland, got us going, was the fact that the ice melted from the lake middle of the winter. And it was only now, in the beginning of March, that we got some thermal footage. It is confirming what the scientists have been saying, and they have located the origin of the hotspots, or where the lava field from 1922 meets the lake, or just one more sign telling us that Askia is likely preparing for an eruption. The magma is getting closer. So, uh, what to expect? It is a good question that not even finest scientists can answer fully. And in one report, I noticed that one of them said, uh, we could do without this lake there, on the caldera. And then we have all those pockets of water or underground streams that turned explosive in 1875. But this 1.2 cubic kilometers of water above the caldera, that might just be the biggest question we face. And there are just so many different stories to choose from when I look at the science reports. The mild version is that uh, there was an eruption in the lake itself in 1926. And this little island emerged then, meaning that uh, an eruption under the lake might turn out better than some expect. And as for the medium version, we can uh, compare this to Surtsey. I've heard that name fly around. That island was formed in a volcanic eruption which began at 130 meters below sea level 
So might we be facing something like this, or highly explosive eruption, but uh, only until the water can no longer easily reach the vents. After that, the main form of activity would be lava fountains or fissures. But this is not the ocean, this is a lake with a limited amount of water, and calculations show that uh, we need almost a cubic kilometer of magma in this pot to uh, get all the water to evaporate, and uh, I'm sure that is going to be a show. But uh, scientists are also saying that uh, eruptive activity could be preceded by some tectonic fracturing, like in 1875, and the tectonic fracturing could be accompanied by uh, basaltic eruptions on a fissure swarm that would start uh, before, during, or after an eruption in the central volcano. So that is the kind of a medium version, and if we go to the medium plus version, then we would add some underground pockets of water and streams into the equation, and such an eruption would be around 5 on the volcanic explosivity index, or a similar eruption as we had in 1875. And then we have the version that the less there to mention. So this is just uh, bits and pieces that I've been picking up here and there. And again, keep in mind that I'm not a scientist, I'm just talking about what I found on my way while making this video. All we know for sure is that we have several elements that don't uh, mix very well up there or this large magma chamber below 1.2 cubic kilometers of water, and then we have some underground pockets of water and streams that have proven to become explosive before, and the third element are tectonic plates drifting apart, or the ultimate cocktail shaker. So I have been getting some hints to check out volcanoes like Krakatoa, and uh, as far as I could read from that event, it was an explosion that split the magma chamber. The volcano began to collapse, and sea water came in contact with the magma. And uh, that is traced to the movements of the tectonic plates. And uh, as for the tectonic plates, we don't lack any such movement here. The volcano is on the plate boundaries, and the 1875 eruption started with some major tectonic movements on the plate boundaries. So the main point is that we have a recipe for a disaster. However, it looks as experts are using the 1875 eruption as a benchmark, but um, this volcano just leaves them with so many different scenarios to work from. In addition to facts like volcanoes undergo changes through time, and the major eruptions like in 1875 changed uh, not only the landscape, but perhaps the nature of the coming eruptions. And to top this all, this number 10 to 100, as for the size of the magma intrusion, is uh, just fueling the uncertainty. So this seems to me as we could be looking at everything from a nice tourist eruption to an explosive eruption, mix in a bag, or something totally new when it comes to the Lake Askja. So it is more or less impossible to look at the aftermath. But as column, like we had in 1875, that would be troubles for international flights for sure. And there is only one thing to do with the airline stocks. If Askja goes off like that. But as for agriculture, farmers in East Iceland have been getting ready. They have asked the civil defense to make a plan, a evacuation plan for the animals or to move them to another county. And if an eruption would occur during summer, that's the worst case scenario, due to the tourist season up there, but this is a national park, and this area, it will simply be closed if things start to look even worse than they do now. And it is the nearby glacier river that could easily become the worst case scenario. Lava flows could uh, force it out of its current riverbed, or even dam the river, and that could lead to devastating floods later on, ruin farmlands, roads and bridges. And this fissure swarm is just so extremely long, and lava from the northernmost lava field since 1875 is just a few meters away from the ring road, highway number one. But uh, there are other roads, so this is not the worst case scenario. And there are just uh, so many elements to consider. 
while predicting the future, when it comes to Ashkia, all we know for sure is that the lake makes the volcano even more dangerous than it already was, and uh, I just have to wonder what happens if the opening from 1875 under the lake were to open up again, like during a tectonic episode, and that question might just sum it up why we face the perfect uncertainty where so many different dynamics come together in this giant caldera in one of the largest volcano systems in Iceland.